Okay guys, in my left hand here, we have little Dougie, the ZV-E10, a camera that I love very much. The image quality that you get out of this $700 camera is absolutely fantastic. The best value video camera in the Sony lineup in my opinion, I based my channel in many ways on this camera because it was such a great value. I had to tell people about him all of the time. Now here is another great value. This is the Sony a6700, a brand new release from Sony, and it is a hybrid's dream. This camera is such a great value in its own right. It has a lot of advantages over the little ZV-E10 right here, but I will put them head to head. What did I put down the ZV-E10? I will put them head to head so that you can see the image quality compared to each other. Spoiler alert, uh, Dougie holds up pretty well, but uh, the thing is this camera does offer a lot more and it does cost a lot more. So what do you get for that extra cost? Well, let's talk about it. Now I love both these cameras and there will be affiliate links down below to both, depending on whichever one you wanna buy, just click one of them, make me stinking rich. But I will say that the A6700, is probably gonna be a long line for this camera. It is very popular. So if you're thinking about pre-ordering, I would do it soon because uh, you may be waiting a while if you wait too long. I pre-ordered mine the second I could, but don't worry, you ZV-E10 fans, I am not getting rid of little Dougie. He is a big fixture on this channel and I know he's a popular camera and a lot of people like to see videos about him. So I am going to keep making videos about the ZV-E10. So let's get right into some image comparisons because I know that is what is most important to a lot of you people and why you are watching this video and I'm not here to disappoint you. So uh, first I will show you the intelligent auto settings just the straight out of the box. If you press record in intelligent auto in both cameras, what you would get and then I will show the footage in S-Log3, which I think is the best picture profile for the A6700 graded with the Leaming LUT, as well as the Cine 2 profile graded with the Leaming LUT because uh, the ZV-E10 is an 8-bit camera. So that is how I find I get the best footage out of the ZV-E10. You can also use HLG3 for a little more dynamic range on the ZV-E10, but I find if you want to match S-Log3 footage, then it's best to stick with the Cine2 profile. So here it is. So as you can see there, the ZV-E10 image held up very well against the A6700 because in these situations I am shooting, say in this studio or out there in Handsome Alley and I am not color grading heavily. I just want it to look true to life, you know, for my videos. Now, if you are getting into some serious color grading, you're trying to do Saving Private Ryan or The Born Identity or any Matt Damon movie for that matter, then, and you're gonna wanna push the colors around a lot, that is when you're really gonna see the benefit of the 10 bit footage. But honestly, for most of the stuff I do and even the stuff that I do that I get paid for, like say shooting uh, interviews and documentaries that are also true to life the way they look, then you can often get away with an 8-bit camera as I just showed. So uh, now if you do want that extra color information, then uh, the A6700 is going to provide it. Plus it will have more dynamic range. You know, you have a bright sky in a situation and some shadows. You're going to see more of that in the A6700. But a lot of day-to-day -day footage it's gonna be hard to tell the difference between the two cameras. Now we'll do a slow motion comparison. Of course, the A6700 can do 4K 60 without a crop and 4K 120 with a 1.5 times crop. Whereas the uh, ZV-E10, if you go past 30 frames per second, you can't do 4K anymore. So if you wanted to do 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second on the ZV-E10, you are in HD. So it's going to have much less resolution, be much less sharp than the A6700. Mm. 
And now here's a situation a lot of people will use these two cameras for, and that is the old vlogging. Let's go outside and see how that goes. This right here is the A6700. I am still under embargo, so we're keeping it under wraps, you know? Don't want people finding out what I'm shooting, letting it go to the internet, and then making me famous the wrong way. You know, I want to be famous for the right things, like my looks and my personality. But look at how good this is as a vlogging camera. This is uh, just using the active steady shot that's here. It doesn't have the dynamic stabilization of the ZV-E1. I was surprised that that wasn't in there, but I'm not a camera engineer. I don't know what goes into that type of thing, but I'm walking here at a fairly decent pace in terms of vlogging. I wouldn't want to go much faster than this. Otherwise, I'd be, in fact, I am already out of breath. So uh, I like to walk a little casually while I am doing the vlogging as to not make the audience seasick. I could speed it up a little bit here and look even more ridiculous walking in this park right now. So this is the ZV-E10 with active stabilization and uh, not quite as good in terms of its stabilization as the A6700 because number one, it crops in about 40% and uh, number two, it only has electronic stabilization. It doesn't actually have any real IBIS. This is all digital. So, uh, and it doesn't do the best job in the entire world, but it is something with this 11 millimeter F1.8 from Sony, you can definitely get away with vlogging because you still have a wider field of view, even with that 40% punch in. But personally, I like to do a different thing, which is use the gyro data that is recorded in the ZV-E10 when I want really smooth walking and talking footage. And this is the result right here. When you run it through the free program, Catalyst Browse there, I use a 10% crop when I am doing this type of vlogging. And as you can see, I have that wide field of view back and uh, I have very, very smooth footage. Look at this. Now people can finally concentrate on my face, which is always my goal. I absolutely love this. It does take a little extra time and uh, that bothers a lot of people, so they skip it. But personally for me, I find the results are more than worth the time spent rendering the file. Now, of course, the A6700 also records gyroscopic data, so you can run it through the free program, the file that is through the free program, Catalyst Browse, and then you can get gimbal-like footage without a gimbal. So ironically, in that situation, you can see that the camera that's called the vlogging camera, the ZV-E10, is not as good at vlogging as the A6700. It is a little bit lighter, so uh, if you were trying to run it on a small, lightweight gimbal, like the Zhiyun Crane M2S, then that could be a benefit for the ZV-E10. However, it's uh, if you're just going to use the actual stabilization that is available in the camera, the active stabilization modes, it crops in so much less on the A6700 and it is more stable. So uh, for me, with the ZV-E10, I either like to use a little gimbal or Catalyst Browse. And of course the camera does quite well when you do that, but when it comes to using the real stabilization in the cameras, itself, then uh, the A6700 is the clear winner here. Of course, the A6700 also can utilize the gyro data. So if you want that extra smooth footage, you can get it on that as well. And now let's go out to the east wing of my estate and do a low light test. Everyone loves a low light test, so let's get at it. So anyone who's watched my channel for any period of time is probably not that surprised by that result. The ZV-E10 is a good camera in low light and so is the A6700. But the ZV-E10, even though it is much cheaper and has an older sensor, that older sensor has always been a very good low light sensor when it comes to uh, in an APS-C camera. And Sony also was pretty aggressive with the noise suppression with that sensor. And uh, so the ZV-E10 can often look cleaner at 
the same ISO compared to the A6700. Same thing when I tested the FX30 against the ZV-E10. But, uh, but since it's a more natural look coming out of the A6700, you can do some noise reduction in post and end up getting more dynamic range. You can also shoot in like say an S-Log3. As long as it's not extreme low light situation, then, uh, then you can color grade that as well and then get more dynamic range. But uh, in the situation I was showing it was already a very, very dim environment. So I wasn't using a log profile for the A6700 because it would just be too noisy. So the bottom line is both cameras for APS-C cameras are quite good in low light and I have no trouble taking either of them out for the old nighttime shoots. And now let's get to a test that will be a landslide victory for the A6700 and that is rolling shutter. Now there is no doubt about it, if you're whipping the camera around, you're going to be doing pans, you're going to be filming things that are fast moving through the frame, like the Tour de France, or you know, the NASCAR, something like that, then uh, you definitely are gonna want the A6700 over the ZV-E10. Like I said, when it comes to vlogging, things like that, you can you know use the gyro data, which can correct all of the rolling shutter wobble while you're walking around, so that's fine, or you can use a gimbal, but if you are going to be hand holding your camera and you're going to be moving it around, the jello effect you're going to see on the AC, uh, not on the ZV-E10, the A6700 has a good rolling shutter performance, much like the FX30. It is better than an S5 II from Panasonic, better than an A7 IV, not as good as an FX3 or an A7 S3 or the ZV-E1, which has a very, very low rolling shutter, but somewhere in between the A7 IV and the FX3 sits the A6700, which is to say it's a very good rolling shutter performance and out of the two, my God, far better. So now when it comes to photos, the A6700 26 megapixel sensor, ZV-E10 24 megapixel sensor, and the ZV-E10, it takes great photos, and so does the A6700. And when you put them in Lightroom and you edit them a little bit, side by side, once again, you're probably not going to be able to tell the difference between the two cameras. So this is probably a good time to talk about with the ZV-E10 holding up quite well in a lot of the tests that I have done, besides, you know, the rolling shutter, then what makes the A6700 worth $1,400? And I do believe it is definitely worth $1,400. Well, there are a plethora of things that make it worth it. So when it comes to photos, and well, and video, uh, we'll put up the EVF, the 2.36 million dot EVF. It's also quite bright. It's almost as bright as the A7R5's EVF. And uh, having that EVF, it's great on a sunny day to be able to take photos or take videos or check the photo that you just took instead of looking at the back of the screen. Now, in terms of looking at the back of the screen, ZV-E10, 921,000 dots and the uh, A6700 1.03 million dots, but it's a much bigger difference than that sounds. When I see the two screens side by side, the A6700 is a much easier screen to see the detail. And uh, whereas with the ZV-E10, I'm often relying on zebras and other uh, video functions or photo functions like um, a histogram to figure out my exposure because just looking at the screen itself is not that trustworthy. The A6700 has minimum shutter in auto ISO, so that can be very helpful to remove shake from your photos so your shutter speed doesn't go too low. And even though both cameras shoot 11 frames per second in burst mode, the uh, A6700 has a much bigger buffer and that buffer clears a lot faster. So you will definitely be able to get a lot more shots uh, with the A6700. The battery life, the A6700 has a much bigger battery, the FC100, so you can record 4K, two hours of 4K recording, whereas you get about 80 to 85 minutes, I find, on the ZV-E10 in terms of 4K recording. And uh, same thing with photos, you will get a lot more shots with the A6700. The A6700 has that magnesium alloy body. It is tough, it is more rugged, and it is also weather sealed, whereas the ZV-E10, it's a plastic 
plasticky body and you definitely don't want to take it out in the elements. It has 10 bit 422 in all modes. So you want to use S-Log3, you're going to want to use the A6700. When you want that extra dynamic range of say S-Log3 and you're going to do a nice bit of color grading, then you will definitely want that 10 bit 422. The A6700's active stabilization is definitely better than the ZVE-10's active stabilization, less of a crop and smoother footage. The autofocus on the A6700 has gone bananas. It uses AI autofocus and it is absolutely fantastic. The ZVE-10's autofocus is really, really great and there is no need to complain and uh, you definitely can, all, like it never loses me and it has animal detect autofocus for eye autofocus in video as well that most cameras still don't have but the little ZVE 10 has it it's just that the A6700 kicks it up a notch and it can identify planes and trains and cars and it's better at shooting things like birds 40% better in terms of getting the bird eye autofocus in this so if you're an avid birder then you know the A6700 especially with that burst rate things like that it's, it's a better autofocusing system. But the ZV-E10s is still great. It's got that AI auto framing thing, which is kind of cool. Make it look like a cameraman is following you around and keeping you in the center of the frame. It can also zoom in and zoom out at 15 or 30 second intervals. And uh, that's a fun feature to have. You can add custom LUTs to the A6700. So when you're using that fancy S-Log3 with the 10-bit footage, you can put your LUT right on there. And instead of seeing a gray washed out screen, you can see how your footage is actually going to look. The A6700 has the in-camera time-lapse correction you can still use the S and Q or uh, in the ZVE 10 or the regular photo taking mode and then you know put it in to a time lapse yourself in post with the ZVE 10 but there's an extra mode on the A6700 where it will be taking the photos and then makes a movie in camera for you spits out a 4k movie and you can just stick that all there on your YouTube video or whatever you're creating. The A6700, this is a big one for me, has 4K30 streaming coming straight from USB-C. I find that that is my favorite way to stream these days, straight from the Sony camera right into my computer. No capture card is needed and the footage looks fantastic. Now you can only use picture profile off. You can't actually use S-Log3 or anything like that. So you got to stick with picture profile off, but luckily I think that looks great. If you watch my last couple of live streams, I am streaming straight generally from my ZV-E1 because that can do the same thing, 4K 30 streaming. I absolutely love that. Now with the ZV-E10, you can get a Camlink 4K or a Rode Streamer X and still stream uh, 4K and it will look super great. It's just that it doesn't have the USB-C streaming. Well, it has it, but it's at 720p, which, you know, for Zoom calls, that might be okay. But if you're trying to stream to YouTube and things like that, you'll probably want at least 1080. I prefer 4K. The A6700 has a much better menu system. It's a full touch screen for the menu. And there's also uh, extra functions on it where you can swipe on the menu, swipe them on and off, and you can swipe up for the quick function menu. You can also change things like shutter speed, aperture, and ISO just by dragging your finger on the LCD screen. So a much better user experience. The menu is laid out better and it is much easier to navigate. Now the ZV-E10 does have a few advantages over the A6700, depending on who you are. It has the product showcase mode, which I have used on occasion. And uh, the A6700 doesn't have product showcase mode. So you'll have to manipulate your autofocus settings yourself by digging into the menu. Whereas with the ZV-E10, it's just the touch of one button. Speaking of a touch of one button, you can do the uh, focus, the background defocus button. So if you're a beginner, you don't know how to, you know, use your aperture and shutter speed and ISO to get that blurry background or that clear background, you can just press the button and there you go. It is of course a much lighter camera, easier to take around for travel because it's smaller and lighter, easier to run on tiny little gimbals. And of course we cannot forget that it is half the price of the A6700. So while the, I don't think the A6700 is very expensive for what it offers, the ZV-E10, very reasonable at $700. So I think this video is good news. From start to finish, let me explain. The A6700 is a fantastic camera, fantastic photo, fantastic video. And if you have a ZV-E10, it's a wonderful upgrade. If you have the budget, you get so much for the money 
that you are paying. But let's just say you don't have the budget. The ZV-E10, when used well, can produce images that are very comparable in many situations to a much more expensive a6700. They take the same lenses. You know, it's a true upgrade path right there. You can have it as a second angle or a third angle. You can keep it as your main angle. The ZV-E10 is still capable of producing great photos and great video. But once again, if you have the budget, you will not be disappointed with the A6700. So anyway, thanks for watching. We'll talk to you again soon. Okay, bye-bye.